It is my <clears throat> great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Manesh Mehta, who is one of the world's uh, leading brain tumor specializing radiation oncologists. Dr. Mehta serves as the deputy director of the Miami Cancer Institute and chief of radiation oncology at Baptist Health, uh, the Miami Cancer Institute. He is also the chair of the Energy Oncology Brain Tumor Committee. Speaking with him today is his patient, Mr. Daniel Ponton. In their next session, titled From Bench to Bedside to Beam, Radiotherapy Advances for Brain Tumors, we will understand how radiotherapy serves as the backbone of treatment for most brain tumors and how innovative technologies and techniques have improved its safety. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta. Take it away. Uh, Vinay and everybody at ABTA, thank you so much for giving Dan and I the opportunity to share some time with you today, and especially for everybody listening in. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I thought what we would do is a two-part uh, approach here. We would start with Dan's story, and then we'll use Dan's story to catapult myself into a discussion about the value and use of radiotherapy in patients with tumors of the central nervous system. So with that, let me introduce Dan Daniel Ponton to you. Dan is a Renaissance man who mm -hmm. uh, does a wide variety of things. As you get to know him, you'll be amazed as to what a fantastic individual he is. He and I had the opportunity to meet about five years ago when Dan's tumor had actually recurred. But before we talk about the recurrence, Dan, let me take you back to your original diagnosis Perhaps you could share with us what your symptoms were, how you discovered you had a tumor, and what happened. <clears throat> well, uh, Dr. Mehta, thank you very much. And I want to thank the ABTA for this opportunity to share my story. It's been a while since I've done a thing like this. And it is, it's, it's kind of uh, empowering to, to live through it again. So 16 years ago was a long time ago in brain tumor time. And um, my symptoms were um, that I had gained weight. I was not, I was sleeping 14, 15 hours a day. I was irritable. I started my career when I was really young. I was in my mid forties. And when they tried to figure out what was wrong with me, everyone said to me, I was having a midlife crisis. There was no, there was, the conversation of having a, a brain tumor was not even a possibility. It wasn't even on the radar screen. So I pledged myself to be active again, didn't figure out what was going on. I started playing some tennis. I was always a lousy tennis player, but I was even worse now. So I went to, uh, to get an eye examination. The eye doctor said to me, Dan, there's nothing wrong with your eyes. Go get a retina um, uh, test. And the retina specialist says, go see your doctor right away. I'm giving him these films. Um, it was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. The doctor said, I'll see you on Monday at seven o'clock in the morning on that Friday. I got a call. I said, come see me right now. And that's where we discovered that the menjanoma was and was sizable, and it was something I had to deal with right away. So Dan, what happened? So then, what happened was um, I was still irritable, and as you, at being a frontal lobe, I, I found out later that that's not uh, crazy. Um, I went and uh, I spoke to Dr. Zinner, who is with a, a founder CEO of, of Miami Cancer, who was up in Boston at the time. And he said, Danny, you have to come up here and see and see a neurosurgeon. I went up there to see a neurosurgeon who told me um, all kinds of different things. I, of course, negated nothing. I negated mean, everything. My family's, you know, I said, I'm irritable. I'm not irritable. Then my family was like, are you crazy? This guy's like, he's really irritable. Well, to make a long story short, I came back to Florida thinking that this was not, this couldn't possibly be it. And then after about a week, I realized, you know, maybe I'm just wrong. And I called the doctor back up there and uh, he said, come right now. So I got on the next airplane. The next thing you know, I was up at the Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston and had um, 18 hours of brain surgery, three teams of doctors. And, um, and that was the beginning of my return back to being uh, my old self again. So you had the tumor taken out. You thought everything was going great. You were followed for a few years and eventually all looked good. So you stopped getting MRI scans. Is that correct? Well, so my, the, the immediately, I have to tell you that my, my, I was very blessed in many different ways. One of them was that, um, that uh, my recovery was, was for a very dramatic surgery was pretty, pretty dramatically quick. And I was back to my old self again in a relatively short period of time. And the routine MRIs became a little less routine, a little more lax in, in the six months, became eight months. And I was pretty comfortable that I was over this. And probably about 10 years passed 
when I decided that it was time to you know, be a little bit more diligent. And I, I had gotten plenty of them, but it maybe not quite as timely as I should have. And um, then the surprise came. I remember it like it was yesterday, very similar to the other surprise, except for my, my brain was still was now functioning. It was seven o'clock in the morning. My doctor said, I got something to talk to you about. And it was like, what could we have to talk about? And he goes, your, your tumor's back. So that was 2017. More or less, yes. So was that like a ton of bricks falling on you? How did that feel? Um, anger was one of the issues. I really thought that after being through all the brain surgery and all the time that had passed, that this was something behind me. I think there's a certain level of, um, of that. I, I couldn't believe that it was, it was possible that, that after having gone through all these situations that it could happen again. And then the idea of, the, of seeing what the outcomes or the possibilities of where do you go from here, the one that uh, I did not know much about radiology. And, and, and in that conversation, that surprise came back to me that I may have to go through brain surgery again. And similar to a, a, the idea of having to go through that whole ordeal was I had taken, a, I was unprepared for it. Let's put it that way. Okay. Well, so let's pause on that question about what you did next, because I plan to show a couple of pictures that'll show you tumor and yes. uh, I'll show you tumor and, and bring you back in for one more comment at that point about how you felt. So let me start with the slide presentation. Alrighty, so this is my uh, disclosure statement. I have no relevant disclosures for this particular session in this talk. Um, I'm sorry, go back. So the learning objectives, Dr. Gandhi summarized them very well. I plan to describe some of the more commonly used radiotherapy technologies, uh, outline what they are, and demonstrate how they're used for patients with different types of tumors of the central nervous system, and then talk a little bit about how radiation therapy actually works and how it more specifically kills tumor cells than harming normal tissue. Let's begin with an overview of the cancer landscape in the United States. Part of the problem that many of you are aware of is that tumors of the central nervous system do not receive as much attention as many of the tumors. And the reason for that is obvious. If we look at this graph of cancer incidence, this is a 2022 graph estimating the incidence of various tumors in the United States, neurologic tumors in that big fat gray arrow are actually pretty much close to the bottom in terms of incidence. This is not one of the most common diseases that is seen in the landscape of cancer therapy or cancer incidents. And as a consequence, it often becomes an afterthought. It's useful, however, to remember that brain metastasis marked in yellow come up pretty high on the incidence radar, third or fourth most common tumor in terms of the incidence that brain metastasis present with. So if we actually include brain metastasis, this is a common problem. Now, my talk is going to focus on the use of various radiotherapy technologies. And what I wanted to point out is the fact that as a nation, we are really blessed by widespread availability of high-tech radiotherapy. It is estimated that about 70% of the US population lives within 12 and a half miles from a radiotherapy center. So most patients can get to a radiotherapy center. But radiotherapy is not all the same. There are many, many different technologies. And the field of radiotherapy is cluttered with the word salad that you see on the left-hand side of this slide with words such as IMRT, SBRT, SRS, and so on and so forth. This can all become very confusing very, very quickly. But what you see is that conventional radiotherapy and intensity modulated radiotherapy, which are the top two rows in this table, account for more than 80% of all treatments that patients receive. And then the others are highly specialized. And we'll look at some examples of these highly specialized treatments. So let's start by taking an example tumor. I've created a tumor just behind the eyeball. this patient with what we call two-dimensional radiotherapy, where two radiation beams coming from the left, one coming from the right, are, paint, are pointed to the brain. The entirety of the brain would be irradiated as well as the tumor. So you wouldn't miss the tumor, but you would definitely treat the entirety of the brain, which you certainly do not need to do. 
This can be improved upon using CT guidance, using a technology called three-dimensional radiotherapy. And now you can see that some of the brain, the blue has gone away, purple is a lower color dose, and the red is the higher color dose. There's more dose in the tumor, less dose in the normal tissue. You can improve upon this even further using intensity and volume modulated techniques, which you can see in the third image. And the image furthest to the right is the intensity modulated proton therapy image, which shows that with protons, we can control the radiation dose and localize it just in the temporal lobe. And essentially each of these technologies represents an evolution in terms of shaping the radiation dose to the specific anatomy of the patient's tumor and the surrounding normal tissues. That doesn't mean that one technique is necessarily always superior than another technique. It just means that we have to be able to evaluate these various techniques and find the one that is best for each patient. So let's come back to Dan. Dan's tumor was located between his eyes. That tumor that you see in red is my rendition of a margin around his tumor. The tumor is known as a meningioma, and it is in a crucial location just between his eyes. The blue and the green lines that you see there are his optic nerves that are crucial for his vision. And right behind that in orange is the optic chiasm. Again, crucially important for vision. Behind that is the brainstem. And of course, there's a pituitary uh, gland that's also located there that you can see as the orange structure on the sagittal view on the right. So this is critical, critical real estate. And the tolerance of these structures is very limited. So when Dan first came to us, we said, okay, this is going to be tough. This is going to be challenging. And what we decided to do at that point in time was to go to our radiotherapy orchestra. We have a variety of different pieces of equipment, and each one does one particular thing better than something else. And we decided to pick and choose amongst these modalities with the idea that we would employ the optimal modality for every patient and their unique tumor. And using, using that principle, we decided to create comparison plans for Dan's tumor. The one that you see on the left is a very commonly used technique known as VMAT. It's a form of IMRT. This is a very commonly available technique, which does a very good job of treating the tumor, but splays all that dose in blue onto his temporal lobes. That's tolerable, but not necessary. And then in the center, we see proton therapy. We were actually quite convinced that proton therapy might turn out to be the best. But what we found with proton therapy was actually the frontal lobe dose that you cannot see on this particular slide was higher with proton therapy because the beam was coming in from the top of the head and therefore radiating his frontal lobes. And we didn't want to radiate, radiate his frontal lobes. So we then went with the cyber knife. And if you look at the cyber knife plan, it's actually shaped better to fit the tumor. And eventually this is the plan that we used to treat Dan with. And as a consequence, this plan, which is now magnified, was the plan that we used. And that was five years ago. So Dan, how have you done over the last five years? Uh, uh, Am I back on here? Can yes, you hear you me? Are. Well, I, I'm, it's remarkable. Um, I have to say that the process was challenging, but not painful. It was, um, it was nerve wracking, but uh, I, I didn't suffer from fatigue or or any of the other things you would think about. So I can I can only say I'm very grateful for what we went through. It was tedious, but it was uh, it, it was an extraordinary turnout. And then you did something special to get through the uh, tedium of getting cyberknife radiotherapy because you love music. So what did you do? It's funny. I didn't know you were going to bring that up. So I, when I got there, I realized I didn't have very good music. And my, my process was about one hour a day, uh, five days a week for about seven weeks. So I, and what, when you sort of get into that position and you're having this and an hour can be a very long time. So they had kind of a, a piece of equipment that most of the kids didn't even know what it was. It was a CD disc player and I must have had a thousand CD discs and I brought them in and we realized that it was about three songs and then we changed position and then three more songs and then we changed position and fourth songs and it was over. And somehow that allowed me to you know, compartmentalize the time period. So an hour didn't seem so long. And also I taught a whole bunch of young people about music they never heard before. So as I like to say, we set Dan's radiotherapy treatment to music and uh, knock on wood and thank God five years down the road, his tumor has remained stable and Dan remains pretty healthy. So with that, let me proceed with discussing some more radiotherapy technologies. Many of you have probably heard about the technology of radio surgery, which is actually quite similar to the technology that we use for treating Dan's tumor. 
Diane's tumor was treated with 30 fractions of what we would now call fractionated radiosurgery or fractionated radiotherapy stereotactic. Radiosurgery typically uses a single fraction and it's used for small tumors in the brain. This is an example of a tumor called a vestibular schwannoma. It's a benign tumor that typically occurs on the nerve sheath or the nerve roots of various nerves, most commonly the eighth nerve. And it affects hearing, facial function, and sometimes the trigeminal or the fifth nerve. And we can achieve excellent results with a single treatment if the tumor is small. So these techniques are very, very effective for small tumors delivering high doses of radiation. So if we now start looking at which brain tumor patients benefit from radiotherapy, it starts looking like a laundry list. And this list is only a partial list. There's far more tumors than I could put on this one single slide. But you can see that there are many, many patients with tumors of the central nervous system that can potentially benefit from radiotherapy, either used singly or in conjunction with other therapies. So how is radiation used to treat brain tumor patients? Sometimes we'll use it postoperatively. And here the idea is we want to decrease the likelihood of tumor recurrence and improve survival such as a meningioma, which is what Dan had. Sometimes we'll use it to impede tumor cell growth for a very, very long time. And again, this leads to survival and cure in tumors such as craniopharyngioma or pilocytic astrocytoma. Sometimes we use this to delay tumor regrowth, which prolongs survival, but does not permanently eradicate the tumor, such as in glioblastoma. It can be curative in diseases such as germ cell tumors, primitive neuroectodermal tumors, and others. We can use it to alter function, such as secreting tumors, tumors that make hormones from the pituitary gland. We can affect that and normalize hormone secretion. And sometimes we just need to get rid of the mass effect. The big lumpy tumors that are causing symptoms can be made to shrink with radiation. So let me give you some examples to show you the role and value of radiotherapy. This is a table that lists the outcomes of patients with meningioma. And if we now look at the column that says subtotal resection and radiotherapy, the 10-year regrowth rates are about 20% compared to about 55% if radiotherapy is not used. So clearly there is a dramatic improvement with the use of radiotherapy in a tumor such as a meningioma. If we look at a tumor such as a craniopharyngioma, again, using subtotal resection and radiotherapy, there is a dramatic reduction in the recurrence rate from about 73% without radiation down to 17% with the use of radiation. If we look at curative tumors, there's a whole list of them. I'm going to show you just one example, germinoma, a germ cell tumor of the central nervous system. If treated without radiotherapy, survival historically used to be less than 5%. With the advent of radiotherapy technologies, survival in this disease is over 90%. Reduction of hormone secretion is a major outcome of treating pituitary tumors. This is an example of a growth hormone secreting tumor. This tumor can cause all kinds of symptomatology, including phenomena such as gigantism. People can grow very, very tall and very big if, the, if this tumor occurs prepubertally, or acromegaly if patients have already grown, their bones get larger, their organs get larger. And this, in fact, decreases life expectancy by about 10 years. The secretion of growth hormone can be dramatically decreased with the use of radiosurgery, and this is a very effective use of radiation. Most of you have probably heard about proton therapy, and I'm going to in introduce the concept of proton therapy by showing you a very unusual tumor. This is a tumor known as a chordoma. Chordomas can occur anywhere along the skull base of the spine. In this unfortunate patient's case, the tumor occurred in the sacrum in the tailbone area. If you look at the image on the left-hand side, the entire gray stuff in the back half of the slide is tumor. And I'll show you a picture of that so you get a sense for how big this tumor is. This tumor was four liters, almost four kilograms. That's about nine pounds of tumor, just to get a sense of it. That's the size of a baby. And this tumor was treated with proton therapy in January 2018. And as you can see, in six months, there's dramatic regression and reduction in the size of the tumor. The pelvis, the bones of the pelvis are in white, is reforming. His rectum, which was situated in the front of his body because the tumor had pushed it all the way back to the front, has now moved back to the back where it should be. 
This is what he looked like before proton therapy. This tumor was abutting out of his sacrum and then reduced within a matter of months with the use of proton therapy. So clearly reduction of mass effect, reduction of huge tumors is another potential benefit of radiotherapy, which obviously from a symptom perspective can be very beneficial. This patient could barely walk in January, 2018. As you can see, his back is bent over. By August, 2018, he could stand up straight and he could walk well. For him, the most pleasurable thing, he could pick up his daughter again. And that was a huge quality of life improvement. And this is something we as doctors do very poorly. Something as simple as being able to pick up your child, hug them and kiss them. We have no scientific ways of measuring such quality of life events. And these are so critically important to patients. And it's, it's a blessing to see patients having the ability to enjoy that again. Now, why do we use protons for this particular patient? Well, protons have no exit dose. In other words, we can fire a beam from any angle and it'll stop where we want it to stop and it won't proceed any further. So it's all about sparing organs and tissues. And I'm going to demonstrate that using this cartoon. So in this cartoon, we're going to create a target. The target is the entirety of the brain and the spine. We actually sometimes have to do this for certain tumors. It's called craniospinal radiation. If we were to treat such a patient with conventional radiotherapy, all of the color that you see is various levels of radiation dose. All of the body would be irradiated in the process of treating the craniospinal axis with conventional radiation. If we were to treat that same craniospinal axis with proton therapy, we could actually shape the radiation dose to fit the craniospinal axis with minimal exit dose, and the rest of the body would be protected. So clearly, the lack of an exit dose has major benefit in certain patients in terms of reducing side effects. So I'll come back to craniospinal radiation, but let me explain first how radiation works. When a radiation beam goes through tissue, it can directly damage the DNA molecule using this path called direct effect, or it can hydrolyze a water molecule. It can break up a water molecule, which produces free radicals, especially hydroxyl radicals, which then produce an indirect effect or damage on the DNA. The indirect effect actually predominates the effect from conventional radiotherapeutic approaches. With things like carbon ion radiotherapy, which I'm not going to talk about, the direct effect is significantly more important. When we look at tumors, this graph on the x-axis shows the dose of radiation and on the y-axis shows the level of effect. As the radiation dose increases, the green line goes up. In other words, the level of effect from radiation is going up. For tumors, a small increase in dose, which you see at the upper end of the curve, results in only a small change in outcome because usually we maximize the dose to have the highest possible effect. So increasing dose a little bit on tumor does not do much in terms of tumor control. We really have to increase the dose radically, and that's part of the reason why we need fancy technologies to achieve that. For normal tissues, on the other hand, we aim to keep the dose as low as possible because we want a low level of damage to normal tissues. And what that means is a slight increase in dose can have a very dramatic impact in late side effects. So this conundrum of increasing the effect on normal tissues, which we don't want to, is what we are trying to prevent when we use fancy technologies to try and find the best technology for each patient. Radiotherapy can cause side effects and toxicities. We know this. We know, for example, that patients who get whole brain radiation, for example, can have memory deficits. We know that these memory deficits are a function of the radiation dose that we deliver. Together with Dr. Gandhi, who's actually organizing this uh, event today, we've done a lot of research to show that a structure called the hippocampus in the brain houses stem cells that are crucial for the formation of new cells that allow a patient or an individual to maintain memory. And this cellular structure is highly susceptible to radiation. We have done a number of clinical trials we're using these fancy technologies, we can save or spare the hippocampus. And as a consequence, patients can have the same level of tumor control, but with significant improvement in their cognition or memory functions. I had mentioned to you that I would come back to craniospinal radiation. 
very, very recently, just a few months ago, at the ASCO meeting in Chicago. Dr. Jonathan Yang, Yang and his colleagues from Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital presented this particular trial where they took patients whose disease had spread through the craniospinal axis. We Dr. Mehta is calling in. He'll be on in just a minute. Thank you so much for your patience and thank you, Daniel, for waiting. My pleasure. We see you on, Dr. Mehta. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, fortunately, that was the very last slide that I wanted to show in terms of the use of technology with protons. Um, so I can skip my conclusion slide and we can go straight to the Q&A session. Perfect. Ambreen is going to read some of the questions that we received aloud for you and Dan to respond to. All right. Thank you all so much for your patience and thank you, Meta, Dr. Meta, for calling in. Just as a reminder, if you have questions that you want to ask, please type and submit it uh, on the right hand side of your screen. Just click the ask a question button, type and submit, and we'll answer as many questions as time allows. All right. So we do have quite a few questions. So, all right. One of the first questions we have here is asking, are certain regions of the brain more susceptible to necrosis? And if so, is there anything that can be done to minimize this risk? That's an excellent question. And in fact, uh, the answer is indeed yes. We know that necrosis does not occur with equal frequency in all parts of the brain, and certain regions are far more susceptible. We also know that certain patients are more susceptible, and that patients at a certain age are also more susceptible. In addition to that, there is a possibility that underlying disease conditions might also predispose patients. So it's a combinatorial um, uh, issue that leads to this event. Now, in terms of what we can do to prevent radiation necrosis, this is something that is truly a works in progress. One of the things that we're beginning to recognize and identify is that agents such as bevacizumab might have a significant effect. We know that once necrosis occurs, bevacizumab is very good at reversing it, but there are also some preclinical data that suggests that it could potentially decrease the incidence of radiation necrosis. Thank you so much for that answer. Another question we have here is asking about edema or, and how radiation can lead to edema. Are there any new developments uh, regarding reducing that effect in patients having radiation? Again, an excellent question. So for the most part, when we use fractionated radiotherapy, where we use relatively low doses of radiation on a daily basis, the incidence of edema or swelling of the brain is very, very low. When we start using very large doses, as we do in radiosurgery, the likelihood of edema starts going up, especially if we treat large volumes, and especially if we treat patients that already have pre-existing edema. We had done a study several years ago with colleagues at the University of Maryland where we developed a model to try and predict risk factors for patients at greatest risk of developing edema after stereotactic radiosurgery for brain metastasis. And we found a number of intriguing variables, including one that we have not yet revalidated in another study. That patients who continue to smoke had a greater likelihood. Again, this is a finding that needs to be revalidated in a larger study. We also found that patients that were already on dexamethasone because they had significant swelling tended to be predisposed to getting more swelling. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Mehta. Another question from an attendee here sharing that they've heard mixed feedback about radiation. Uh, some have heard that radiation can have minimal side effects and others have said it can be more severe. Can you talk about why that is? Do different forms of radiation have different severity of side effects? This is indeed a very complex question and needs to be highly personalized and individualized. For the vast majority of patients, we can deliver radiation very safely. There are certain patients that are definitely at a much higher level of risk of radiation complications. This is a function of many, many variables, including the host variables, that is the patient's own variables, tumor variables, tumor size, tumor location, and radiation variables in terms of how much radiation is given with each fraction. 
So this really, I showed you a slide where I talked about playing the orchestra of radiotherapy equipment. So this is where this art really comes into play that you need to individualize the radiation technology to minimize such risk. Thank you so much. I think we'll take one last question. So uh, this attendee here is asking about if there's anything that can be done to help the skin in healing and recovering after radiation has been do done. And maybe Dr. Mehta, we can have you talk about that a little bit. And then Dan, if you want to share what your experience might have been um, in your skin recovering after radiation therapy, I think that would be really helpful to hear. So there are two broad medical approaches that we take for this. The first is that we use multiple different beam angles. If we use many different beam angles, then one portion of the skin does not get too much radiation and therefore the effect is lessened. The second thing that we do is we will use medications if skin reactions occur to decrease the intensity of these skin reactions. And fortunately with modern technologies, we can use multiple different beam directions thereby reducing the likelihood of severe skin reactions. But Dan had gone through this process, so maybe we can hear from Dan whether he had problems with his skin and if so, what he did with it. Well, th thank you, Dr. Mita. I, I, I really sort of educated myself on the process prior to having it done and had a certain level of uh, comfort that exactly what you were saying was a possibility. I have to honestly say that I had no problem with any kind of skin problem per se. And I think what the reason that you explained is exactly why. Um, even though I had a significant amount of radiation for a significant period of time, I did not have any skin uh, issues at all. Great. Well, thank you, Dan, so much. And thank you, Dr. Mehta, for answering these questions. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Emily. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.